tonight on CBC Vancouver News. The family basically has no idea how all of this happened and uh, why it would happen. Unanswered questions. Families of the BC murder suspects hoping for answers. Also, evacuation alert expanded. More crews on the way to help fight a wildfire in the Okanagan Valley. And... Just like a bad dream. Bad dream. Faulty Foundation, the stratophyte that's forced Langley residents from their crumbling townhomes. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. The manhunt for two teen murder suspects from Vancouver Island may be over, but it's becoming clear tonight there will be no easy answers for anyone, including the dead fugitives' families. The CBC's Tanya Fletcher spoke with Briar Schmigelski's great uncle today in an exclusive interview. The Schmigelski family says it's inconceivable what has happened. So this is the first time we've heard directly from any of the family here in Port Alberni. Briar's great uncle is now acting as the family spokesperson, and he says the past few weeks have been very troublesome and very worrisome for the family. He actually saw Briar and talked to him the day before he left. You know, we've got a, a, a young person that was basically going out to find his fortune and to find his way of life. Briar was a, a polite, uh, kind young fellow, and uh, he just graduated. And, and you know, it's just, uh, it, it's, it's just inconceivable. He says Schmigelski and McLeod were two young men you would not be afraid of if you ran into them. They didn't have that kind of presence. He says they did leave on that road trip with a fair amount of cash in their pockets, so they're wondering as much as anybody what the motive might have been. He says that they were really hoping they'd be found and captured so they'd get some answers. So far, police have been very uh, quiet to provide them any details on the investigation. The RCMP have not disclosed anything to us, and uh, so... You know, we're just waiting for all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, we're waiting for her to see what happens uh, with the autopsy to find out where the cause of death was. And uh, um, it's extremely trying for the immediate family, extremely trying time, as it has been for all of the other families involved. He says RCMP have not disclosed any details to the family about how or when the two might have died. He says they are ready and willing, though, to cooperate with investigators so they can finally get some answers about what led up to this. In the meantime, he says their hearts and their prayers are with all the other families involved. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Port Alberni, B.C. And later on this newscast, Tanya Fletcher's full interview with John McNabb. Watch for that at about 6.30. Now, as Tanya said in her report, it's still unclear exactly how Briar Schmigelski and Cam McLeod died or what the suspected killer's motives may have been. Well, today we're learning that a Manitoba River adventure guide says he helped police narrow the search for the pair after he spotted something along the Nelson River near Gillum. That's where I saw a sleeping, or um, what I, be I believe to be a bag or a sleeping bag or something, something floating in the willows contacted the RCMP and they came and got it and that's when they flew over the rapids and seen the boat. RCMP confirmed the items found along the river were directly linked to the suspects and helped them narrow down the search which led them to the bodies nearby. A forensic team has been at the scene all day and RCMP say they need to conduct a thorough investigation before they release any more information. Autopsies on the two bodies were conducted today but it's unclear when the results will come in. The wildfire near Oliver is now 15 square kilometers in size, nearly double what it was yesterday. It's burning above the community and close to the nearby town of Gallagher Lake. But even with the danger so close, business owners, our Brady Strachan spoke to, are still urging tourists not to give up on their holidays in the region. The fire is clearly visible from here in Oliver. The hot, dry weather and winds have caused this blaze to grow significantly since Monday. The fire is filling the sky in the region with smoke. It's billowing up in columns from the steep slopes to the east. But here in town, locals say they are unaffected. 
Jody Wilson manages a restaurant in Oliver. The last three years we've gone floods to fires, so I think people are expecting it more and more every year because of the dry conditions. The summer tourist season is critical for businesses in the South Okanagan, and Wilson hopes Thanks tourists today. won't cancel their trip to the region because of reports of fire and smoke. All the wineries are open, all of the businesses are open except for a few that are really close to the fire. Um, the firefighters are fantastic and they've been doing such a great job. And it, as I said, it's more up on the hills, it's not down here. The BC Wildfire Service is fighting the fire on the ground and from the air. About 250 properties are on evacuation alert, including the South Okanagan Correctional Center, a maximum security jail. Today, fire crews conducted a controlled burn, much like this one yesterday, as a way to burn off fuel at the edge of the blaze. Despite the smoke and flames, these guests at the Gallagher Lake Resort campsite north of Oliver say they aren't leaving. When um, it first happened, it was panic, but... Yeah. Everyone was, like, packing up all their stuff, and then um, a bunch of people left from the campsite, like, cleared out, but it's fine now. And what was your thinking when that happened? I don't want my campsite to burn down. <laughs> I've been going here for over 10 years, so... And a lot of the people here have been, so that's the big thing. It's a sentimental place to everyone. The smoke in the region hasn't stopped Brenda Hauser and her daughter from doing some wine touring today. They say living in the Okanagan, you get used to the smoke. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're elderly or your children or somebody with a compromised immune system, that's a whole other situation. Um, but otherwise, if you're in good health, yeah, get out there, have fun. And even though there's optimism here in town that the worst is over, the fire is still growing. The BC Wildfire Service says the extreme temperatures and rocky, steep terrain make this one stubborn fire to put out. Brady Strachan, CBC News, Oliver. Let's bring in meteorologist Brent Soderholm now. We heard Brady mention those uh, extreme temperatures in that area. What uh, can we expect over the next couple of days? Yeah, well, at least for the next 24 hours, those extreme temperatures really are going to be part of the story. But there is going to be a significant change by the time that we get to Sunday. If you can believe it, temperatures in the area are going to be dropping by as much as 20 degrees Celsius, going from 37 potentially down to 17. Right now, as it stands, however, we do still have an extremely high fire danger rating for the entire South Okanagan. That has not changed. That has been dry for literally the entire month of August thus far. Temperatures almost certainly being above 30 degrees for that entire time. The special air quality statement issued by Environment Canada is still in effect right now for the entire southern region here. That is not going to be going away likely until this weekend and temperatures today yet again into the upper 30s. We're looking at widespread temperatures around 37 degrees toward Warfield, Castlegar and Nelson and then 37 down into the Soyuz. But this is the change up that I was telling you about. There is going to be some much needed rain on the way to bring some natural relief to what's been going on. This is going to be happening throughout Saturday and into Sunday and it's specifically going to be throughout Sunday where those temperatures, as I mentioned, probably into Penticton, for example, going down to about 16 degrees. We are expecting some thunderstorm activity with this, though, so it is a bit of a double-edged sword. There will be rain. That will certainly help the situation, but with thunderstorms does come the risk for additional strikes of lightning, so something we'll have to keep a close eye on, but then everything will go back to normal, hopefully, by next week. All right, bro, thanks. Talk to you again in a bit. To Langley now, where the coroner and BC's police watchdog are investigating the death of a teenage boy at a local skate park. BC's coroner's office says the teen was found at the skate park near the Walnut Grove Community Center Wednesday night. He died later in hospital. Coroner's looking into exactly how the teen died, and the Independent Investigations Office says it is looking into the incident as police were in proximity when it occurred. Well, strata struggles are nothing new. Councils can crack, tempers can flare, and the lawsuits can pile up. In Langley, two couples don't know what to do next, though. In a four-year-old battle that's left them evicted from their townhouses, deemed to be too dangerous to live in. Bell Peary reports. When their patio door started to stick, Terry and Barb Hodson thought they simply needed a new one until they saw what else was going on in their Langley townhouse. Our granite countertop had pulled away from the wall. Our backsplash was cracked. And our wood flooring had pulled away from the wall by about this much. Our kitchen cabinets, our fireplace in the corner, all pulled away from the walls. It was 2014. The home the Hodsons had lived in for 15 years was quickly falling apart around them, and they didn't know why. 
Engineers were in and out and agreed there was damage to the foundation. But according to the Strata Council... They came back and said it's just a little bit of settlement and told us go ahead and fix the cosmetic repair ourselves. The damage escalated. The city of Langley issued a do not occupy order. The Hodsons were evicted. Just like a bad dream. The couple upstairs was also evicted. I want Strata to fix my building, fix my, our home. The townhouse is part of a 14 fourplex neighborhood. According to bylaws, the Strata Corporation is responsible for structural maintenance and repairs. So far, there's been no commitment to do anything. So now it's the summer of 2019. We've been out of our home for two years. They've been talking about getting quotes since January. The Strata Council denied CBC requests for an interview. In the meantime, the situation has cost the residents tens of thousands of dollars. There's the cost of a lawyer, there's the cost of an engineer, the cost of having to rent somewhere else, the price of putting possessions in storage, yet they're still making mortgage payments and paying strata fees. 74-year-old Russ White says he's had to go back to work full-time to make ends meet. It's 20, 21 to $2,500 a month out of my pocket. Now, if you're a retiree, if you've got that much money to spend, well, good for you, but I don't. The delay in repairs doesn't surprise advocates for residents who live in multifamily developments. You're one of the collective and oftentimes what happens if there is a problem that only affects one or two units, the overwhelming majority of the other owners often say, well, it doesn't affect us, so why should we pay for it? The owners of the damaged units could go to the province's Civil Resolution Tribunal, to BC Supreme Court or the City of Langley for an order forcing the strata to make the necessary repairs. We own this home and we have we have no say in what's going to be happening um, basically a, you know a random group of volunteer neighbors hold what happens in our home uh, in their hands at this point there's no indication when the ousted residents might be able to go home for good Belpuri, cbc news langley the family of a toddler who was sexually assaulted and murdered 36 years ago is speaking out publicly for the first time tonight. This comes as the man who pleaded guilty to the crime is applying to be let out on bail while he appeals his conviction. Then 17 years old, Philip Talio originally pleaded not guilty to suffocating 22-month-old Delavina Mack to death in Bella Coola in 1983. His lawyers changed his plea to not guilty nine days into his trial. In 2011, one DNA tissue sample ruled out Talio as the source. Another did not. Two years later, another partial sample concluded the killer could have been one of Talio's male relatives. Delavina's family says they fear for the safety of other children if Talio is released on bail. Today, her cousin read out a statement from Delavina's mother, who is still struggling with her daughter's death. People need to understand that Delavina was an innocent toddler and that she came from a very loving family. We do not understand why the story has changed after admitting the crime. Talio has applied to wait out his appeal, which is still a year away, in a monitored residence instead of jail. Indigenous leaders are urging the federal government to shut down recreational salmon fishing along BC's south coast. The calls come amid a rock slide that's cut off a spawning route near Lillooet. John Hernandez reports on what further closures could mean for an already struggling industry. After decades of selling fishing tackle, Brian Ford is closing up his East Hastings shop. We've had a good run. We've been here for 30 years. The owner of West Coast Fishing Tackle has lost about a third of his customers over the past few years as the federal government clamps down on salmon fisheries across the province. It's been tough for us, you know. Um, they keep uh, closing fisheries down. Like, certainly uh, it was tough last year for the sockeye. Um, you know, every, every year it seems to get a little tougher. The recreational fishing industry in B.C. has seen its fair share of challenges as salmon stocks dwindle. The latest, this rock slide in the Fraser River near Lillooet, clogging up a busy sockeye and chinook spawning route. Fisheries and Oceans Canada have already put restrictions on fishing along this river as crews scramble to transport thousands of fish over the barricade. What we can do is uh, uh, just uh, stop fishing right now to be because right now there's a lot of unknowns. But Indigenous leaders like Terry Tiji say the rules don't go far enough. 
The B.C. Assembly of First Nations wants the DFO to indefinitely shut down all recreational and commercial salmon fishing in the Salish Sea so more fish have a chance to make it upriver. I think it's really important that um, the, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans call upon sports and recreation and, and the salvage of, to commercial fishing. That would mean the closure of the Ocean Chinook fishery that already had a later than normal start this year. I feel for a lot of other people in, in the industry, you know, uh, guides, uh, outfitters, offshoot business, people that are selling ice and bait and that sort of thing. You know, it's, it's been tough for everybody. The DFO hasn't said if it will consider any further closures. For now, it's focused on getting fish over the barricade. While 6,000 have been transported, millions more are on the way. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. Provincial and federal officials are investigating after someone destroyed a colony of cliff swallow nests at Pitt Lake. As CBC's Rafferty Baker reports, swallow populations are in steep decline and they are a protected species. In June, they were just cleaned right off. I mean, nothing up there. Local birders who frequent the Pitt Lake area noticed the colony of swallows had built about a dozen nests on an observation tower. They say the nests were first removed in June, but the birds had rebuilt. Now it appears someone has once again destroyed the nests. Obviously, somebody has a, a desire to get rid of them. Well, I said not again, because it had been done before, and we never did find out who did it the first time. And so far, we haven't found out who's done it this time. Swallows, their nests and eggs are protected under the Migratory Birds Convention Act, as well as the Provincial Wildlife Act. The BC Conservation Officer Service is investigating the alleged nest destruction, along with the Enforcement Branch of Environment and Climate Change Canada. But so far, they haven't reported any leads in the case. I don't understand why people would do it, whether it's somebody that just doesn't like the, the birds flying around the tower and maybe they thought it was uh, stopping people from going on the towers. But to me, it's something that the, 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 the people that visit here can go and see. It's part of nature. Swallows are common enough still, but their numbers are in steep decline because of the loss of insects, climate change, and a shortage of nesting sites. The cliff swallow, just as an example, um, has lost 87.7% of its population in British Columbia since 1970. Um, nationally, it's about 72%. So that's a lot. An official with the province has posted a warning sign to the public at the tower since the nest removal was reported. But local birders just hope they find out who did this and that it doesn't happen again. It's illegal. It's immoral. It's unethical. It's a tragedy. Rafferty Baker, CBC News, Pitt Meadows. And you can watch that story along with this entire newscast and all of CBC's other award-winning content wherever you go by downloading the free CBC Gem app. And CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook and YouTube and on Instagram. Follow us on all platforms for extra content you won't see on TV. On a dire warning from the United Nations tonight, coming up, what it says we must change to prevent catastrophic climate change. And thanks for watching us tonight on Facebook or YouTube. And for tonight's edition, we're taking you back to the 1980s. It was 34 years ago when Midday introduced viewers to a new fad, footbag, as it was called then, but you probably better know it by the name, the brand name, Hacky Sack. Ann Petrie reports. What's going on here? The 1985 version of Frisbee, Hacky Sack. Now, keep your eye on that bouncing ball. The idea is to keep it up in the air with as much style as possible. In the fine weather, pickup Hacky Sack games happen all over the city. Hacky Sack is a brand name. The generic word is footbag, and there's all kinds of them on the market. This crocheted one is called a granny bag, and the black one with the studs is for punkers. There's also a book about footbag, and there's even a regular magazine which tells you about competitions where you can win up to $10,000 in prize money. Now, some players are very good. These two fellows are former Frisbee champions who've turned Hacky Sack crazy. It is very challenging to be able to uh, use both your feet 
Well, for example, most people when they start, they, they're only going to use one, one of their feet. There's, it's as if one part of their body is totally lame. They'll, they'll hop around one foot, kicking with their right foot, but the object is to be able to, to flow gracefully uh, around the sack. Of course, it takes a lot of practice to get graceful, as these two new players are finding out, but the effort is worth it. That's an exercise. It's just like playing racquetball. You work every muscle in your body. And it's lots of fun. It's like addicting. And it's great because you get a whole bunch of people together. You can play with any amount of people that you want. And you just have a good time. Play it anywhere. Well, are there any rules? Uh, you're not allowed to use your hands. And you're not allowed to say you're sorry because uh, everybody makes mistakes. <laughs> Nobody wins at hacky sack, but clearly competition isn't the appeal. It's very sociable because when you play it in a group, you know, there's three or four people kicking. It doesn't matter if it falls to the ground. It's, it's just very, I think it's a real social, sociable, fun activity. It's no surprise that hacky sack got started on the laid back west coast, but it is spreading. By next summer, the little bouncing ball could be the biggest thing on your block. Still see people doing it every once in a while. Never got quite got the hang of it myself. Anyway, stay with us. So we're going to be back with the latest headlines from across the country in just a few moments. We have heard the warnings about climate change many times before, but tonight, a new and urgent call from the United Nations. If we want to save our planet, the UN says we've got to change what we eat and how we produce it, and fast. It's calling on consumers and food producers to make changes. But as Alison Northcott reports, some Canadian farmers already have. Now, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to keep our soil quality in the best shape we can. Saskatchewan farmer John Bennett practices what's called zero-till farming. If we till ground too much, we turn it into flour, and it has no uh, ability to resist water erosion or soil erosion. He says the process helps protect his land and livelihood and has another benefit, too. We do a tremendous job in terms of uh, atmospheric integrity by uh, capturing CO2 from the atmosphere and storing it in our soils. That's one measure the UN report suggests to help reduce the impact food production has on the planet. Have to run a balance between, uh, shall we say, environmental stewardship and economic uh, production or uh, food production. Werner Kurtz is one of the report's lead authors. He says Canada has one of the highest per capita emissions rates in the world, but there are many things Canadians can do. Whether that is through improved sustainable land management, improved sustainable forest management, uh, or the consumption of food, reduction of food waste, um, changes in, in diets, uh, more plant-based, more grain-based, uh, and less high emissions uh, meat protein-based. All of these activities influence the uh, emissions from our behavior. The report says cutting meat consumption eases pressure on land and water resources, but the Canadian Cattlemen's Association says it is a leader in sustainable beef production and says cutting down on meat is not the solution. In Canada, we're one of the most efficient producers of beef cattle, which is why we have one of the lowest footprints in the world. Environmental groups say Canada should heed the report's warnings about land use. We cannot take these natural ecosystems for granted. We have to work hard to protect them because they will be the systems that both help us uh, m adapt to some of the impacts of climate change. She hopes the report will lead to more commitments from world leaders meeting at a UN climate summit next month. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Meanwhile, in Alberta, a local state of agricultural disaster has been called in one county. Lac Saint Anne suffered flooding last month, drowning crops and making it difficult for farmers to harvest livestock feed. Rafi Bujakanian has more. But that's dead. Dennis Potter is not counting on a good crop this year. We've, we're three weeks from harvest, and I don't think we'll get in if it continues. We won't get in if it continues. 
After a month of almost non-stop rain, about a third of his 120 acres of oat crops is a write-off. I farmed for 60 years and I've never seen this. It's much the same situation all around Lac Saint Anne County. Local officials are warning of increasing desperation among farmers and ranchers. We have tons of acres that are underwater and crops are drowning. Um, we're seeing upwards of 80% mortality in some of these fields uh, from what we viewed. It's the second year in a row they've declared a state of agricultural disaster. Last year, an early snowfall ruined the harvest. Many farmers finished that year with lower yields of animal feed and were counting on stocking up this season. That's not happening. Emergency. We are hoping that that will open up some funding and some assistance. Provincial officials are certainly aware it's not an ideal crop season. A report at the end of last month showed the region around Lac Saint Anne was 11% behind its five-year average for crop yields. After the rainfall comes the flight. This soil and crop expert captures aerial pictures, helping landowners map out their properties to see how much is usable. The gray areas are basically 100% lost. He says this year is bad, but he says farmers are used to dealing with unpredictable weather. It's part and parcel of, of farming. Um, you'll never have a farmer say, uh, you know, there's absolutely perfect conditions or it's always, it's a little too dry or it's a little too wet. Dennis Potter is watching the skies too. You just sit back and pray for good weather okay. to get in to get the rest of it. Hoping the province will come through with help if nature does not. Rafi Bujikan, UNCBC News, Lac Saint Anne County, Alberta. Like many people, they too have questions. Coming up, the family of one of the teen fugitives from Vancouver Island speaks out.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. A wildfire southeast of Okanagan Falls continues to grow tonight. The evacuation alert has expanded and more crews are being called in to help battle the Eagle Bluff fire. So now it's the summer of 2019. We've been out of our home for two years. They've been talking about getting quotes since January. Their Langley townhouse is unsafe. The foundation shifting and crumbling. Their strata council isn't doing anything about it. And the city says they can't occupy their home. BC First Nations are demanding all recreational and commercial salmon fishing in the Fraser River be immediately closed. They say it shouldn't reopen until the landslide can be cleared to give the salmon a chance to return to their spawning grounds. And back to our top story now. The family of one of the teens wanted for three killings in northern BC is speaking exclusively to the CBC's Tanya Fletcher tonight. It's the first time they've spoken publicly since police announced yesterday the discovery of two bodies believed to belong to Briar Schmigelski and Cam McLeod in a remote part of Manitoba. Here now is an extended version of that exclusive interview. Well, first of all, I mean, uh, this tragedy it affects five families and, it, and really it affects them in a very similar way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've all lost uh, somebody that was uh, important to us and uh, and dear to us and uh, uh, you know as far as Briar is concerned uh, I saw him the day before he left and uh, you know we've got a, a, a young person that was basically going out to find his fortune and to find his way of life and and um, you know we've this circumstance has come about uh, the family basically has no idea how all of this happened and uh, why it would happen. Briar was a, a polite, uh, kind young fellow, and uh, he just graduated. And and you know, it's just uh, it, it's it's just inconceivable to the, to the family that that this has happened. And uh, so I, you know, I. I know that the picture of Briar has been painted substantially different than than we might vision, envision it. But to us, uh, you know, that's that's what we're going to remember is 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 that kind, polite young guy that uh, you know that was six feet tall and uh, looking to find his way. Yeah, you said you talked to him or you saw him the day before. What yeah. was what was he like then? Well, he was with my sister the day before. Uh, Briar didn't have a driver's license, so my sister was uh, uh, he was with my sister in the vehicle. So, you know, it, uh, she had said that uh, you know he was off the next day and uh, uh, going to Whitehorse to to find that big job and all the money and all that stuff. So, just uh, you know, we don't have anything that hasn't been released on the media already. Uh, you know, as far as anything internal. Uh, uh, what happened, how it happened, anything else. Uh, the RCMP have not disclosed anything to us. And uh, so, you know, we're just waiting for all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, we're waiting for her to see what happens uh, with the autopsy to find out what the cause of death was. And uh, um, it's extremely trying for the immediate family, extremely trying time, as it has been for all of the other families involved. Yeah. What about the relationship with Briar and Cam? Did you know Cam at all, or did you ever meet? No, I, I don't know Cam, and I know that they were really good friends, and that they had been throughout uh, uh, school, and uh, uh, you know that they did spend quite a bit of time together, and and so that's really all I know about it. And I understand it was Cam's truck that was they turned into, or he turned into a camper van to take on this road trip. Well, it was actually a pickup truck and a camper, okay. so y yes, it was it was his vehicle. As I said, uh, Briar didn't have a driver's license, so he, you know, he didn't have a vehicle at this point. So. Mm -hmm. okay. And um, so you'd never met him at any family gatherings? Or no, no. Um, uh, but it sounds like, I mean, yeah, very good friends. Um, it sounds like both like video games. Were they, do you know, if involved in any uh, sports teams or community groups or anything like that? Uh, no, I, I, you know, as for Briar, I don't know about Cam, I think he was a little more outgoing than Briar was, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, Briar, Briar liked to uh, uh, to play video games, and uh, and uh, the, he uh, uh, liked 
to hike and things like that. Mm -hmm. So um, the uh, he wasn't involved in any teams or sports or other than if there's teams on video games. I don't play video games, so <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. know how all that works. But yeah. Um, but you said like it sounds like a very different kid that you, from what you knew from what you think has been portrayed, perhaps. <sighs> Well, exactly, you know, and, and uh, speaking to uh, the uh, staff sergeant in charge of the investigation, he, he indicated that that's not unusual, that, uh, you know, the side of folks that we see and think we see as on a daily basis can change, uh, given some input that we don't know about. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it, we're, we were hoping that they would be found uh, and, and captured, and that the story of how this all unfolded would be would be available. Uh, you know, it's going to make it a, a lot more difficult for the RCMP to come up with with what really happened, um, because if you met these two fellows, uh, you know, they're not not people that you would be afraid of. Uh, that or just don't have that, didn't have that presence. And uh, uh, so uh, it's just, I, I don't know, I really just can't explain it. And it sounds like you mentioned yesterday on the phone, it's almost like there must be some other piece that's missing. Well, there had to be some kind of a motivation. Uh, you know, they, they left with a fair amount of cash in her pocket. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're light, unlikely that it would have been that in that short of time period. Uh, so there must have been a motivation that that sparked it in the first place. You know, mm -hmm. like I'd, I'd, and, and they would typically be the kind of people that would be helping somebody mm -hmm. instead of hurting somebody. So, and your son had mentioned too, like it's you don't want to jump jump to conclusions. Like they were never convicted; they were charged in one of the cases. So, yeah. well, and and the family's been given no information with regards to the investigation you know nothing about what they found and and what seems to point towards uh, the boys being uh, part of it so like i say the media has got absolutely just as much as we've got mm -hmm. as far as that's concerned so how frustrating is that it i mean it's been very uh, for the family uh, you know the close family it's been it's been very uh, troublesome, worrisome, uh, you know, the, the, the days that have gone by and, you know, they're looking here and looking there and, and, and you know, the pictures that are out there as far as uh, the, the surveillance pictures and so forth, um, y you know, y y you have this vision that they're going to walk out of the bush and, and, and that's going to be that, but that's not the case. So um, it's... Uh, but trying to get to the bottom of what happened is is the family's wish and anything that the family can do with regards to helping that investigation will, will be done. That was John McNabb, great uncle of murder suspect Briar Schmigelski, speaking to the CBC's Tanya Fletcher earlier this morning. We will be back with more news and Brett's weather forecast in just a second. Stay with us.
Hundreds of tourists have been evacuated from Taiwan, and that country has called in the army as it braces for a typhoon. Residents there preparing for powerful winds and torrential rains. The storm comes hours after an earthquake cut power to thousands of homes. Schools and businesses are closed, flights have been canceled, and 2,000 people, mostly tourists, have been moved to safety. The military is on standby amid fears of flooding and landslides. The storm is expected to hit Taiwan today before moving on to hit Shanghai on the weekend. And Brett Soderholm is here now also tracking those uh, typhoons. Yeah, because it is typhoons plural, if you can believe it. This is the one that we were just talking about. This is Lake Yima right now, kind of in the East China Sea, making its, ward toward, making its way rather toward mainland China. But if you'll notice over here, we have a second one that's spinning simultaneously. This is Krosa. Now, this one is not doing a lot right now. It did dump a lot of rain onto Guam last night, but it is going to be making for Japan by next week. So this one is just going to be sitting it out for a little while, but all eyes right now on Lake Yima. And the reason for this, it is 220 kilometers an hour in terms of wind speed. These are sustained. This would be the equivalent of a Category 4 hurricane. And the difference here, hurricanes occur in the Atlantic Basin, whereas typhoons are going to be in the Northwestern Pacific Basin. As we look ahead to its track over the next little while, it is expected to be making landfall on the eastern coast of China around Saturday morning with wind speeds around 185 kilometers an hour. But it will be targeting Shanghai directly. And this is a city, really, population of 26 million people that are going to be impacted impacted by this as it likely goes there as a tropical storm before finally dissipating into the very northeast of the country. Now that said, closer to home, we don't have all of that rain and winds associated with such a powerful system, but we are in fact going to be looking at a little bit of rain coming to the region throughout the weekend. Now, this is not something to lament. We've been very dry. We desperately need this rain. It is likely to be spotty on Saturday. A few showers here and there throughout the day. Clearing up by the evening hours, it's going to be a really tricky weekend to say whether or not it's going to be loud lasting the whole time, but by Sunday, we're still going to be dealing with a few showers there. And worth mentioning, as I said earlier, the temperatures are going to be cooling down quite drastically into the interior, and this is something that's going to be the case for us as well on both of our weekend days. So when I do show you what our five-day forecast is coming up for the city of Vancouver, you're going to notice a little bit of a downward trend in terms of those temperatures. So Friday, another day, mix of sun and clouds expected, but both for Saturday and Sunday, I have put the icons in there saying you're probably going to be getting a few showers here in there. Confidence is a little low right now in terms of how much rain we'll be getting, but honestly, every little bit will help at this point in time. We'll get into next week, and then those temperatures are going to be able to rebound a little bit, getting a little bit above seasonal, and I think that sun's going to make a welcome return by that point. Timing may not be the best if you've got some weekend plans, but hey, as I keep saying, we desperately need this rain. So. Yes. And the people who have to work on the weekend, well, they're, they're kind of happy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's right. Good point. Good. Yeah, and you're right. We do need the rain for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, at a busy intersection in downtown Vancouver, a gigantic mural wants to spark a conversation about our environment. Yeah, very fitting. The Burrard's Arts Foundation uh, unveiled a 20-story or 66-meter tall public art piece at Burrard and Georgia. Now, the mural is named Earth Justice and is made by American artist and activist Shepard Ferry. Ferry says the mural, which is part of his Earth Crisis series, is a reminder to protect our fragile planet. This mural is about preserving the Earth, um, taking care of the environment, combating climate change, and hopefully it's something that just initiates a conversation in a, in a way that's not provocative but more inviting. The launch of the mural coincides with an art exhibition at the Burrard Arts Foundation that features other works of fairy. U.S.-based Chase Bank is bowing out of the Canadian credit card market. Coming up, the unusual but welcome parting gift for its customers here.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. CBC Vancouver is a proud sponsor of the Vancouver Queer Film Festival. The festival showcases dynamic and thought-provoking films and provides a vibrant space for queer arts, culture, and community. And your favorite summer tradition is back. Musical Nooners is back for its 10th year, so grab a lunch and a friend and enjoy free concerts weekdays at noon all summer long. For more, check us out online. Langley RCMP are looking into a disturbing killing of a farm animal that was captured on video. CBC Vancouver News at 11 host Stan Burrett joins us now with more on this. So Dan, what happened? Mike, first of all, as you mentioned, this video is very disturbing and we're choosing not to show all of it. It happened before 5 a.m. on August 1st at Eagle Acres Dairy and Pumpkin Patch in Langley. Here's part of that video. You can see a man approach a five-day-old calf in its pen. He then gets under the fence, into, under the gate, goes up to the calf, and that's where we cut it. Because after this, he appears to stab the animal repeatedly. It falls to the ground, and he drags it out of its pen. Langley Mountie said the animal was then put in the trunk of a newer model black sedan and driven away. The farm owners, understandably, are devastated. They say the animal may have been shot with arrows and then stabbed with one. They're horrified by what they call the inhumane end of life for this animal, let alone it being stolen. Mounties hope to get some clearer images so someone can help identify him. They do say two people entered that farm that morning. We don't see much of that other person, and we'll have more at 11 o'clock tonight. Mike. Okay, Dan, thanks very much. Well, American-based Chase Bank is bowing out of the Canadian credit card market. And it has an unusual parting gift for its customers here. As Simon Dingley reports, the bank is forgiving all outstanding debt on its two Visa cards. Come here, bud. Chewy, come. Paul Adamson feels the weight of the world has come off his shoulders. He owed more than $1,600 on his credit card. Last week, when he went Ready? to make a payment on his Visa card, he was told he no longer owed anything. Good boy. I don't believe that. <laughs> so I actually checked several different sources beside the customer service rep I spoke with, and sure enough, they forgave the debt. I was amazed. The Amazon and Marriott cards were retired in Canada last year, but many users were still paying the cards off. The provider, the Chase Bank in the U.S., won't say how much it's writing off, nor how many Canadian customers will benefit. Have you ever heard of anything like this? Never, no. One of Canada's credit monitoring agencies says the average Canadian credit card debt was more than $4,000 in the first quarter of this year. Chase could have sold its outstanding debt to a third party, which could have gone after the customers, but chose not to. Spokesperson Maria Martinez told CBC in a statement, Ultimately, we felt it was a better decision for all parties, particularly our customers, to forgive the debt. We would expect the banks, um, as banks are very good at doing, to, to chase very hard to get every last dollar they possibly could um, from the people that, that had those credit agreements. So um, the, the very, very abrupt exit, I think, is something that um, has puzzled a great deal of people. Luke Sheehan works for a website offering financial rates for mortgages and credit cards. He says Canadians in credit card debt shouldn't count on this happening again. It's probably up there with winning the lottery or discovering an inheritance from a rich billionaire uncle you didn't know you had. Paul Adamson says he's elated. He's socking away the windfall to put towards a new house. Simon Dingley, CBC News, Toronto. The federal government is warning Canadians to exercise a high degree of caution should they choose to travel to Hong Kong or mainland China. The advisory comes amid the large-scale demonstrations over the controversial extradition bill that would have allowed people in Hong Kong to be extradited to mainland China for trial. The protests have been going on since June, but the level of violence has escalated rapidly over the past few weeks. Global Affairs says the situation is of particular concern in light of the 300,000 Canadians living in Hong Kong. It has also issued an advisory for mainland China due to the risk of arbitrary enforcement of local laws. Well, with local anxiety rising over his decision to scrap special status for Indian-controlled territory in the disputed Kashmir region, Prime Minister Narendra Modi addressed his nation. Jammu Kashmir and Ladakh, a new start has 
Modi calls it a new era for Jammu and Kashmir, as well as Lukta in the Himalayan territory controlled by India. He says the change of status will lead to greater employment opportunities and allow for development of the region as a tourist hub. And he insists most Kashmiris welcome the move with only a small pro-Pakistan faction stirring up trouble. And Pakistan, which also claims control of parts of the region, fears India's move will lead to an influx of Indian nationals to Kashmir, altering the region's largely Muslim demographic. Today it announced it would suspend train service to India. Pakistan says it has no plan to take military action but is seeking a political solution. While the ping pong balls are flying at a senior's home in Burnaby, we'll introduce you to the players next. Friday on the early edition, a study from the University of Exeter suggests that if you stare at a seagull in the eye, it's less likely to steal your food. We'll test that theory on Granville Island tomorrow on the early edition. Well, residents at a long-term care home in Burnaby are proving that age is really just a number and that the game is never really over. The CBC's Deborah Goebel visited the home today to find out what's keeping those residents on their toes. Jasmine Murtadza stares at the photo for a long time. She is the young woman in the patterned dress and once she loved to play badminton. Did you play a lot? Oh yeah, every day after work. But that was a long time ago. I don't feel old. I feel happy, I feel, I enjoy, I don't feel old. Oh, nice. wow. These days, ping pong has taken the place of badminton. When you get a little older, sometimes you have to tweak things a bit 
We found that the residents were getting very, very competitive, so we said, why don't we do a tournament? So, Maria and Carlos, you've got your champion reigning still. You've got 15 points. And Jasmine and Amy had a very healthy nine points. Yeah, I'd like to win. Yeah. Do you know, is there a strategy? I'm trying my best. Like Jasmine, Mary was an athlete back in the day. I was a professional dancer. She danced in Vegas, she says, the Flamingo Hotel with Frank and Dean and Sammy. <laughs> That's it. Mary. And when she came home, she danced with Ballet BC. Yeah, I look in the mirror, eh, not too bad for 88. How old do you feel? What I wish or what I feel? Either, both. Uh, I feel like I'm 50. Time passes, bodies age, but what you see on the outside doesn't always match how you feel on the inside. I think if you take the time to know them, there's always a little gem. Every month at the Normana home, a resident is featured. Highlights of a life. I see a woman with great strength, kindness, gentleness. Back outside at the ping pong tournament, plaques are handed out. Everybody gets one because it's not about winning, it's about showing up for the game. Deborah Goble, CBC News, Burnaby. Big deal, all right? Yeah, that's just a heartwarming story. Oh, yeah. My own personal quick anecdote here, my whole family got together to play a family tournament of ping pong, including my 70-year-old grandmother, and that's a memory I'm not gonna forget. We had a lot wow. of fun together, so it's cool to see a lot of people coming together to do the same activity. Remarkably, our family did something similar really? recently too. Yeah, it was beer pong. <laughs> Yeah, the whole family. <laughs> that is way more fun that way. Our there you go. Beer pong. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, yes. Okay, Dan Burrett steps up to the table for 11 o'clock tonight, right after the National. Thanks for watching tonight. Good night. Thanks.